Hi everybody, it's Kate Noella here and I've got a wonderful interview today coming up. It's with my special guest, Sean Kay. I haven't known Sean for long, but he's obviously been around online for some time. He's got a lot of experience and knowledge to bring to the table, I can assure you. Sean actually has two online businesses as his main focus of income, rapidactionwriting.com and rapidactionseo.com. He's also created a new blog recently, which is mainly consisting of a podcast called wsobackstage.com. And he also has his own personal blog, seank.com as well. Now, I could talk to Sean all day and all night. In fact, this interview went for over two hours, which was really quite long, and yet he was still willing to talk more. So he's quite a marathon man to me, and he was very generous with his information and advice and help. And so I'm really glad to sort of give you this interview. I'm going to deliver it in three stages, though, in part one, two, and three. And I'll briefly summarize what's in them in a minute. For every now and again, I would talk to Sean about inadvertently I would talk to him about my product that I've just released the bloggers who podcast for success which really highlights all the benefits of podcasting for people mainly for bloggers especially bloggers like Sean so it's interesting to hear how he's gone with his blogging and podcasting and what he has to say about all that I do have a preview of my course on my site bloggerswhopodcast.com if you sign into there you get sent a preview of that course if you're interested in it because it's not very expensive and it's a it's a great introduction to podcasting for anyone who wants to give podcasting a go as you will hear from sean podcasting is a fantastic way to drive traffic to your site and there's so many ways you can spin your podcast content so when i spoke with sean in part one sean has explained a lot of things about seo inadvertently without me realizing that's what he's doing because i really want to talk to him about his blog but we talked about so much so in part one we talk about seo factors like authority blogging and authority bloggers there's a new term out there called authority rank And he explains all this and how it's relative to bloggers today and helps you get more traffic and why. It's it's just really insightful to know this information in layman's terms. And then I sort of talked to things about affiliates, especially to do with his products. And I, I was also very keen to talk about his return on an investment with his WSO backstage blog. So he shares all those information, all that information with us as well. In part two, the next interview, I'll just summarize basically there. We're also going to talk about the two types of bloggers that are out there and what differentiates the two between them. And then we have a great discussion about a webinar he put out recently, which he sold before people watched it. And then he sold it at the end as well. And then he explains why later why he took it off the market altogether, because I was sort of like, well, why didn't you just keep it going? So it's really insightful to see his opinion on, and well, really, it's really good advice because he's basing all this advice on his own experience kind of really hard to get this good advice so in part two we actually end up talking about building relationships with your tribe or community if it's a podcaster and you know we talk about giving things away free because there's two methods out there at the moment to get subscribers one is that you just ask and hope they sign in and the other is that you give something away free to give them an incentive to sign up And it was really interesting to hear Sean's take on why he suggested not to give freebies away and on what basis you should and when. But, you know, kind of, it was just a fantastic conversation. It really made things a lot clearer in my mind. So I'm sure it will help you that way too. And then in part three, the final part of this interview, we talk about sales funnels. And obviously, Sean has got a lot of experience with this. So it was really exciting to talk to him about how to set up your sales funnel, how to get the people to buy things. He talks about James Schranko's model of the chocolate wheel and how that's all relative to a sales funnel. He then reflects on his own SEO company, rapidactionseo.com, and how they're building affiliate products and the structures. And he's, again, he's basing it all on his own experience, so he's not guessing. Uh, it's really great information. And I really loved the way he summarized his products and how you should create products. The way he summarized his SEO products is he said he wanted to make his clients business easier make their business better and improve their business and then I added on make more money which he was quick to point out well that would be making it better so (laughs) but uh yeah so look and then we end up talking about podcasting as well and of course we talked 
briefly about my product, Bloggers Who Podcasters, again, and, and how that's going. So make sure you come into iTunes, say hello, leave a review. These things always help with SEO for me because we're starting out, or you can go onto my blog, but it's probably easier just to go through iTunes. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again soon with my next interview I've got coming up is with James Shrenko. So without further ado, here's Sean, and he's talking about his latest new project, wsobackstage.com, his blog or podcast, and how that's all going. Hi, Sean. How are you going? Thank you for letting me talk to you today. Oh, you're welcome, Keith. So I actually found you on James Stranko's forum, who we're both a part of. How long have you been with um, his forum? I was a member of Super Fast Results. Right. And that's one of James' products, yeah? Yeah, it was, it was the forum he had before Fast Web Formula, and I got access to that because I, I'd bought Traffic Grab in May of 2011 when it came out. Okay. And so I got a couple of months access to that forum. It was just interesting to, to the, the, some of the discussion and things that was going on. It's a little bit different from most forums. So I stayed there and then uh, I got to know James personally um, through that. And then he had said to me, probably just after Christmas, that he was looking at putting Fast Web Formula together and sort of, you know, asked if that was something I was interested in, in joining and he was just I guess trying to get some feedback from customers yeah. and so when he put that up I think I was one of the first people to join and uh, I moved off super fast results I think the conversation on fast web formula is a little more business oriented which interested me personally are, are you on both still have they shut down no, the no he one? shut down he shut down the other one oh. probably a couple months ago I, I left it when I joined fast web formula I just right. thought it was a bit of overlap so so you've basically come on board probably about 10 months ago so and yeah. around Christmas. And you mentioned that you've been on other forums and any of those that you've been on around, obviously globally, I'm talking as well, that have been really good value like James's? I guess it depends on what your sort of, your background is. I, I done a lot of affiliate marketing and straight internet marketing mm -hmm. for a few years. So things like Bring the Fresh are interesting to me. Okay, um, I saw that. Yeah, it's, rich, it's a bit more focused on straight up SEO. It's a a lot more tactical and people are on there you know pretty pretty open about their job and what they're trying to do and, and how they're going to game google and so right. we run a we run a content creation content marketing seo business so you know for us that's a, a good target audience forums are a good place to actually find customers so um yeah so you sort of find the ones that suit what you do and and where you can add some value and build your build your reputation and build your authority, and then that actually just by happenstance drives your business. Sorry, so you said it, it, the forums are good to build customers. Is that right to get customers? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we started our content marketing business in uh, late July, and the first probably the first month of customers came from Fast Web Formula. So what's the content marketing thing? What's that? So we do let, we do things like um, blog posts and articles and, and we do distribution of those and we um, we do press releases for people and, and, you know, just basic write content and help people distribute it and build backlinks. I remember, I remember on the forum someone asked about press releases and should you do it for every product or whatever and, and James's response was, do you want anyone to know about it? <laughs> Yeah, press releases are one of those ones where, yeah. it, look, they can be a little expensive. If you use something like yeah, yeah. James uses PR Web, so do we. And, you know, uh, list price on those things are 200 plus dollars just on a pretty basic sort of package. And you'll actually get traffic mm. from there. You do get traffic from there, is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you, you do. You, and you get good traffic because it's people who are, uh, you know, interested in what you're talking about. The, and also from a purely SEO perspective, it it. it it does really well from a backlinking perspective. You get a lot of um, you get a lot of good backlinks. Um, we have press releases that get picked up by Yahoo News, for example, and drive you know plenty of traffic. We had one of our customers a couple weeks ago. Uh, one of the press releases went out and eighteen thousand views in the first week. So, uh, you know, a couple hundred click throughs to the site. So, you know, that's. For somebody who has no traffic, a couple hundred click throughs is, it's good. you know, it's better. It's better than yeah, nothing. Yeah. yeah. But of course, you've got to pay for press releases, don't you? What's PR Web charge you? What's that? Or well, their basic, basic? General packages are, you know, probably the best one is about $200. Or sorry, the one that most people would get is about $200. There's another one that's about 300 
And then there's a one where you can an adva- uh, a premium one where you can put like a, a video in there and stuff. And those are a little bit more expensive. If you buy in bulk, yeah. you can get discounts like we do. But um, you're talking buying 30 to 60 press releases and, and, you know, that's thousands of dollars. So the average blogger isn't going to uh, mm-hmm. isn't going to want to do that. But if you're doing something like this, you're doing something like a podcast, then announcing an interview uh, is a good way to drive traffic and, and backlinks and build authority and that sort of stuff. Yeah, but $200 a pop, Yeah, that's tough for a podcaster <laughs> when you're starting out. Oh, you? yeah, sure, unless you have sort of a revenue model attached to what it is you do, it, it is very expensive. But you can, there's other packages you can get. You can, you can, for your own sites and things with PR Web, there are packages you can get where uh, you can just promote your own, your own businesses and they're... I mean, it's not inexpensive, but it's not uh, it's not two hundred dollars a day. Let's just say, and you can um, you can you can publish pretty much every day. So so there's different packages. You just have to look into it. It's like anything else. You can negotiate and ask questions and stuff. But realistically, if you want proper professional press release going out to Google News, Yahoo News, and you know getting picked up by a hundred other places on the internet. Uh, and driving traffic, it's going to cost money. You're you're just buying traffic. It's no different than uh, PPC or Facebook traffic or whatever. You're just buying a different type of traffic. Yeah, solo ads and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a little bit better than solos for sure. I can see two sites that are relevant to you at the moment. Unless I'm wrong, then let me know. SeanK.com and you've got another one called WSO Backstage.com, I think, which I think is a podcast as well as a blog. Is that right? Yeah, so um, we have our two content and SEO businesses. So we have rapidactionwriting.com and rapidactionseo.com. Okay. And those are just more uh, sales sites. We're, we're actually putting together a content strategy for those at the moment. We're going to start doing more videos and more blogs and things um, for those in the next couple of weeks. But the, um, the seank.com site, um, it's kind of one of those ones that, it's been fits and starts over the years. So if you go back into the sort of internet way back machine, uh, that site, you know, blog.seank.com, I did uh, the first podcast on that site years and years ago. I think I started in January 2005. So that one had a lot of content on it for a long time. And it was very technical. I was working in enterprise IT. So I got to play with, you know, I had to rewrite part of the website and everything to get it to handle podcasting, but mm. that really blew up. Like I did a, a series of podcasts. I went over to TechEd, which is a Microsoft event in 2005. I went over to the US for it and I did a series of podcasts at the end of every session that I went to. Mm. And I just sort of described what the session was to people, technical people. And I wasn't thinking that anybody was actually listening. So I started doing this podcast overseas and then and doing blog updates and things. And then I was uh, in Orlando at the time and I got a phone call from the web host saying, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm at this conference and I'm, and they said, well, you've taken down the, the public web server. Oh. So, um, so all these sort of geeks and stuff at this conference had somehow found out about this, this blog post and these podcasts and just were downloading hundreds oh, of megs. <laughs> and this was before S3 and stuff. And so, um, so that was a bit of a problem. So, so it was even kind back, of bittersweet. It was like a compliment, but in a bad way. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those ones. I think when you're an early adopter of anything, you can have problems. I mean, I had a problem. My for Twitter is another example where I had a Twitter account in 19 or 2007. I was one of the first Twitter accounts back when Twitter used to come via SMS. And um, some of my friends at Microsoft got my Twitter address and it got post uh, an interview I did with Microsoft was posted during one of their conferences and I was in the middle of a meeting and Twitter started going off in my phone. It was just like my phone was dancing on the table. Mm. I had to turn it off. So anytime you're doing something and you're early into it, there becomes this sort of pivotal point where it tips and you're not expecting mm. the, uh, you're not expecting the deluge of traffic you'll get from it. So, um, mm. so it can be a little bit disconcerting and, you know, you have to, you have to pay attention to it because it can get out of, get out of control quite quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when I went into seank.com though, um, mm. have you taken a lot of the back posts down? Yeah, we had to because yeah. a lot of it was originally about what I was doing with my technology right. career and stuff and, gotcha. and, yeah. 
and then uh you know the classic lesson there was i was you know i had a job and you deal with people in your industry and you make comments and sometimes those people don't like comments and stuff so you have to be a little bit careful about blogging while you have a job and and what it is exactly you say and and making sure you don't put anyone offside because it's quite easy to inadvertently do yeah so did anyone did anyone contact you and yeah look, I had <laughs> you just sound a, I like had you're a, talking from experience <laughs> well, i had a few problems over the years i mean i had one back then with that blog one of the reasons i originally stopped was we uh we were doing some work with um with some of the big technology vendors at the time and we were a customer but we moved to becoming a vendor and when you're a customer you can criticize people all you like but when you become a partner and a vendor and start selling their products and expecting them to give you leads yeah. they get a little bit more uh picky about who they do business with and um also you know i've had other experiences where you just make a an off the cuff point of view uh i i did one a couple years ago about the national broadband network that got picked up by ray hadley and was suddenly in you know newspapers all over the country and and unfortunately uh, my point of view didn't align itself well with my employer's profit line yeah. so <laughs> um and you know when ray hadley's calling to do interviews that don't sort of align themselves with your employer's best interest it starts to get a little bit out of control a little bit sticky yeah so you have to just be a little bit careful that is quite political though i think a lot of bloggers just blog about you know what they're having yeah, for dinner you know? <laughs> yeah well i think um i think it's one of the things right you have to kind of figure out what it is you want to talk about so with oh. the wso backstage so how did you springboard from sean k.com which is essentially from what you're saying it was podcast to go to wso backstage is that because you're really just showcasing wso offers no, it's kind of a strange one. So I have my internet marketing business and, and uh, one of the things that came up on Fast Web Formula probably back in sort of May and June was, you know, building authority within a, a group and, and then how can you turn that authority into uh, something that helps you make money. Right. And so uh, I was a member of a Facebook group that, was all WSO creators or small small offer creators, let's call it, right, right, rather right. than WSOs. So I said to to James, actually, uh, just in a private conversation, I said, you know, I'm going to try and see how much authority I can build within this group. And so I started going to this Facebook group regularly and just contributing general stuff. And then within probably two and a half months, I was suddenly a moderator of this, you know, Facebook group with a thousand product creators on it. Right. And what, what group is that? Can we join that or not? No, it's a private WSO group for people who create oh, okay. product offers. Yeah. Oh, so you're the moderator. So I'm so so yeah. The so pro you can the, let me in. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the people. But do who, I have to create a product for WSO yeah, to get in? It's, yeah, you have to have a product. That's part uh, of the entry criteria. Well, I'm thinking of doing PLR, so we'll talk about that another time. Oh, okay. Anyway, yeah, for keep sure. going. <laughs> so so these guys who own that, uh, and I think the thing that people have to realize is a lot of those Facebook groups, they're private businesses right like these guys who run this particular one mm. they have a list that you have to join and then they market to that list and the banner in the facebook group is like 200 bucks a day so these guys are running a, a private business here so anyway oh i didn't know that that's interesting Thank yeah you. so there's a thousand so so there's a thousand or so people on this this facebook group and and um so i did a little bit of effort and suddenly became a moderator, which in and of itself gives you a position of authority in those kind of groups anyway. Yes. When you can delete people's threads, you suddenly you suddenly have some power. <laughs> a virtual power. Yeah. And also just by nature of the process of trying to gain authority, you gain authority. You, you say interesting things and you comment on people's problems or whatever. And so... Um, so I became a moderator and then I thought, well, now that I have this position of authority, well, how do I, how do I monetize it? So I did a little bit of a pilot in August where I thought, well, I'll interview a couple people who have products coming out and I'll put it up on a site. And so I threw WSO backstage together in probably an afternoon. It really wasn't a lot of work. And then I did a couple interviews with some people from that group, then took the interviews and decided, well, okay, what else can I do with them? So I transcribed them and, and you know, um, did press releases and those kind of things. 
and suddenly started selling. What did you sell? Um, what are you talking about? You sold the product that they were promoting or? Yeah, that's right. So you become an affiliate of each of the products that you're doing the podcast for. Gotcha. Okay. And then in the middle of the show, you drop your own link. And in the blog post itself, you put your own links and those kind of things. And then all of a sudden, people are finding their way to this interview. Now they're clicking on links and, and buying products. Okay. So Okay, I've got to slow you down now because it's getting exciting. So what you're saying is that you put your affiliate link. Now you said you put it halfway through the show, but how do you do that on a podcast? Because it's audio or I don't understand that. So, okay, uh, before I line up the interview, the person's getting ready to open their product or whatever. So, so you, you know, you have a, say you have a product coming out and I say to you, okay, Kate, I'm going to interview you. Um, Where do I sign up for your affiliate program? Yep. So you give me the link. I go sign up. I get my link. I jump on my site. Mm -hmm. I put my link in my shortener, which gives me my specific shortened link. Mm -hmm. And then right in the middle of the show, I'll say, okay, well, you know, Kate, you've got X, Y, Z product coming out. If anyone's interested, they can pick it up at, you know, WSO backstage forward slash X, Y, Z. Ah, uh, okay. Gotcha. And, and now that does so a know, couple of, sorry, go on. Yep. so it does a couple of things. One is it gets it into the audio of the show. So if somebody's listening, boom, they're, yep. they're right away. They know where to go because they're on the WSO because the links are shortened to my particular URL mm. reinforces my URL brand. Mm. So I'm not sending them to some kind of crazy affiliate link. I'm sending them to a shortened specific to my domain. Yeah. So, so that drives traffic from my site through my site to the affiliate offers. And the other thing then is when you do the transcriptions and stuff in the, in the body of the text is already the URL. So it automatically comes up when you, when you put it on the blog as well. Right. Right. But and, you do that after the interview, Oh, I suppose yeah. you're doing that when you. So, do you post this transcript and the the podcast video on your blog at the same time? So originally we were just doing MP3s, and yeah. now now what we're doing is we're literally going through the process now of turning each of those into a video, putting them up on YouTube, making the MP3 available because that goes straight up to iTunes. Yes, that's right. Um, and uh, we're going to do some work with Lead Player and do. Um, and the, the the advantage of lead player is that we'll be able to put the buy button in the middle of the video. Yeah, is that embedding the affiliate link? Yeah, so I'll put my right. affiliate link right in there and also do lead capture at the end. So we're building a list at the same time. And then, uh, you know, every time there's a new episode, we just mail the list and say, hey, we've got a new episode of the show to come check it out. Yeah, absolutely. Because I've got that program that you can put an affiliate link in the video. But of course, if they go off to YouTube, if they find you on YouTube, I don't think you can embed it on YouTube, it's, but you can embed it on your blog. Yeah, sure. What you do on YouTube, though, is you um, you make sure that you have a slide with the URL in there. And the other thing you can do is make sure, so with YouTube in the description field, this basic SEO stuff is in the description field, you start off with the URL to the internal page where they can find that video but then in the body of the text you can also drop your affiliate link as well well you can make it so that your video is clickable can't you can make it so that if they click on your video at any time i mean you choose on youtube so when they click on it it will go off to your blog or wherever you want it to go your landing page you can do that you can set it up so that it's a url link link so you do that to cover that base fair enough yeah 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 and eventually, if you're a partner, the other thing you can do, I mean, it takes a little, you have to be making some money, is if, if you're, you can do, if you're a YouTube partner, you can actually do in product or in, in show product placement. But that's not, the average person's not going to become a YouTube partner with that level uh, until they're at sort of like a quarter of a million type views. So, uh, so how does that evolve? Did they ask you? Hey. Yeah. So after you get a cert, so what happens is there's a couple different stages of YouTube partnership. So originally you, to be a YouTube partner and get the ads, you had to have probably about a hundred thousand views and you had to join. Now uh, they don't care. They've lowered their standards a fair bit. So <laughs> any, all you have to do is opt into monetization in your settings and then monetize one of your videos 
and now you're automatically a YouTube partner. But it's like American Express, right? There's different levels of partnership you can have with them. There's, you know, you can you can have an Amex card, or you can have a, a Platinum card, or you can have a Centurion card. There's lots of different options. So um, YouTube will contact you at some point in the future, or you can contact them if you get a lot of views and say, hey, did you know that you have other options available to you? And uh, in the past, I've had that where back when you could only have 15 minutes of video, um, I had YouTube pages where, you know, we might have had thousands of views or whatever, and they'll send you an email and say, well, now you can have half an hour of video. So now they don't have time restrictions on YouTube, do they? No, it's gotten a lot easier, but the partnership levels, when you can start getting into the things like the monetize, the higher levels of monetization and stuff, uh, the other one is um, you can have your own image maps and things. You become a, what's called a brand channel partner. Normally, that's reserved for big-time advertisers or big-time video oh. viewers. Um, so once you get into that stage, YouTube, there's a whole... Okay. YouTube becomes a whole part of your business that you really need to spend a lot of time on because um, because you can make a lot of money. The traffic there is absolutely outrageous. But, you know, it's one of the lessons we've learned from this podcast is we've had to get smarter about YouTube. Right. Right. Now, when you say you've learned that from this podcast, what, what do you mean by that? Do you, well, you, you know, that? yeah. So YouTube always had... Um, so I used to do a lot of affiliate marketing and one of the best ways to make money on uh, affiliate marketing was to do videos, right? Yeah. So historically always had a good sense of what traffic YouTube could bring for certain things. The, the pod, this podcast, we realized that we were getting traffic through the press releases. We were getting traffic through syndication and some other things, iTunes particularly but one of the things we needed to do was we needed to get YouTube involved because of the volume of traffic so you know that's now about putting some some slides into the mp3 and making it sort of a little bit more visual for people and also to you know the engagement levels mm -hmm. on video uh, if you do any kind of a test it's quite interesting to see but it, even if if I put an mp3 up for you on my website and I and I put a video up of the same mp3 with one slide it could just be you know your pretty smiling face mm. staring back at me the engagement level of the video is higher than the engagement level of the mp3 okay i didn't know that that's interesting people will look at something but if they're only hearing sound their the multi-tabbed browsers have made us you know adhd on hyper drive so we immediately <laughs> flick yeah. off onto something else but a, a single picture will hold people uh, yeah. a lot longer well, I always put these interviews onto YouTube first, and then I just shoot the MP3 off to iTunes, and you know all the rest is automated through Libsyn. But oh, okay. I don't do the transcript yet. I'm a little bit. I'm not sure. I will do them, you know. But right now, it's not in my game plan, you know. Oh, uh, the transcript is. I think for anyone listening who wants to do, you know, podcasting and and build an audience, uh, transcripts are mandatory. Transcripts have been something. I've done with podcasts, like I said, going back 2005. The volume of traffic you'll get from them over time outstrips the volume of traffic you'll get from the podcast because you're, you're to give you a good example, I did an hour long interview on a podcast the other day last week. When that shakes out with the transcript, that's a 13,000 word blog post. Now, Google goes through and indexes that 13,000 words. Well, we're talking about marketing. We're talking about products. We're talking about... So when you start thinking about it purely from an SEO perspective, one of the things that shifted in the market is Google is getting getting much stronger at understanding what the theme of your website is. Well, if I have a 13,000-word blog post all about one theme... That's authoritative. If it's right? original, yeah, and it will be. Yeah. Well, it has to be original because it's a discussion. I mean, for you and I to have not have an original discussion, we'd have to read from a script. No, so, no. so realistically, it's it's in, inherently uh, original content. The other thing you need to do, and, and this is something people need to get their heads around a little bit, is authority markup. So authorship markup. Um, you really need to to go get yourself a Google Plus page and. Um, put that on your your blog posts and use that uh, author markup because you would be surprised it's not just a little picture of you in google search they actually are now taking that into account that there's a thing coming up 
uh, I'm going to talk about it on a video I'm making later today mm-hmm. called Author Rank. Sorry, what was um, that point? It's going to be, they're calling, people are calling it author rank. It's kind of like page rank, but it's your rank as an author. Right. And so the more creative content you do, the more credibility you establish in a particular set of areas, the more valuable the content you create is. So if your blog post is accredited to you through markup, then Google will inherently value that content more because they see you as a credible source. So authorship markup is something that, you know, people really need to get in front of because it's it's happening now. But if you get caught behind, it's going to be hard to to dig yourself out on. So you're really talking about Google Plus and then your yep. Facebook, your page, and maybe your profile and your Twitter. Yeah. You're talking about the Web two sort of uh, aligned. Sort of. Is that why? Or yeah, sort of. Okay, so think of it this way: um, if people use WordPress blogs, right? Mm. There's the uh, probably the most standard. SEO plugin you can get is the one by Yoast. It's called WordPress SEO. And then in that WordPress SEO, what it allows you to do is establish uh, your, put your Google profile link in the blog so that when it says you're the author, it links your author name, Mm -hmm. so your account, to your Google Plus account. I've seen people put about me and when you click on it, it goes to their Google plus page. Right. And it's all kind of the same thing. Yeah. And, and, but what That's it does fun. is in the markup. So in the actual code on the page, the markup of the website or the web page itself, it uses a, a, a relative tag, like a rel equals author. And then it uses your Google plus link. So then Google knows that the author of this page or the author of this content is this person who has a Google plus account. And so then the more you use Google plus and the more, uh, content you create that you've attributed to yourself, the higher value you become as a, as an author. There, Google did a is not really widely known, but Google back in well, I think it was two thousand and six or seven, they applied for a patent called Agent Rank, and Agent Rank was all about this kind of thing: was somehow finding a way to link content and value content based on who the agent that created it was. Well, that agent has now changed to author and there was an update to the patent in 2011 that then turned it into basically that agent became their Google Plus account. So all this stuff's kind of happening in the background where when people say uh, SEO is changing, the change that's happening in SEO is that we're moving away from uh, just purely backlinks being the indicator of quality pages to the author being the originating quality source. And then if you link to somebody else, then not only does the value of the page you're linking from indicate the quality of where it's going, but so does the author. So so, so let me just jump in here. So an example would be like, say, Darren Rouse, pro blogger, and a, yeah. a significant component of his blog now is guest posting. Right. So are you saying that will rank a little bit less now because it's not no. Darren himself and it's really no, no. grading that content? On so the there's board? two... Uh, Okay, now there's two elements to that, and this is something that's changed again pretty recently and something that people aren't probably yet in front of as much as they should be. There's just two elements. There's the publisher and the author, wow. and in, you can have a publisher for the site. And so the publisher of that site will be, I'm almost Darren. certain, I haven't, checked in, I haven't checked Darren's thing, but it'll be pro blogger, right? Mm-hmm. And then mm-hmm. anybody as an individual, they may have their own Google Plus profile or whatever linked to their author, um, to their author name. And so then they're the author and they're the publisher. So now you end up with your authority site being uh, the news. So like Pro Blogger is an authority site. It's one of the biggest, well, it's probably the biggest blogging authority site on the internet. Now, inherently, uh, because it's on Pro Blogger, Google can assume it's probably pretty good quality. So it's going to inherently get a, a quality boost. Then if you had somebody like, Brian Clark, who would have a high level of authority as an author, if you had Brian Clark posting on Pro Blogger, now you're going to get extra boosts. Now that's that's starting to make its way, and we're starting to see if you do any kind of experimentation and stuff on SEO, you're starting to see that uh, all things being equal, somebody who's a more authoritative author is starting to rank ahead of the guy who's a less authoritative author uh, author and people who don't have authority or authorship tags at all sometimes they're not 
ranking as well as people who do. But I thought that's how it's always been. No, 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 no. Right, it, so you could you, originally, you like five years ago, you could jump in on an authority on Google uh, keyword search alone. That's what you're saying. Twelve months, twelve months right. ago. I mean, right. Twelve months ago, I can give you examples. There, we did. Um, there were things. This thing called launch jacking, where if somebody comes out with a new product, you uh, create a, a similar site, and you just basically bombard links and try and rank for the keywords, right? Oh, um, yeah, that's terrible. I I had sites ranking for people's names and everything, where I would outrank them for their own name. Um, uh, so. You asked about SeanK.com, and one of the reasons why I keep that blog and put stuff up there occasionally has nothing to do with that's a place I really want people to go and find out what I'm thinking. It's just that it allows me to control my brand. I, uh-huh. If you want to go to look me up, uh, I, I kind of have an authoritative site about me. Um, there was a good conversation on Fast Web Formula about this this week, about losing control of your own name. Anybody yeah. who doesn't have their own dot com name should be seriously investing in that because absolutely, yeah, it's I agree. it's uh, it's a dangerous thing to lose. Yeah, you don't want someone to Google your name and not find you. Find other people with your name. That's exactly like if you look at Kate, Kate Luella, that's it. Bang, I'm right at the top three searches. You know, that's what I'd want. I'd want people to find me, not someone talking about me. Don't want that. <laughs> That's a no-no. Or even worse is, yeah, somebody, somebody who hasn't, well, somebody who has an axe to grind. I have to ask you a technical question, can sure. I? Yeah, you yeah. were saying, when it's, we're backtracking a little bit, you know when you said in WSO Backstage, you uh, put the mm-hmm. affiliate link as a shortener and you said you use your URL, so WSO Backstage, four slash, drop yeah. on, whatever, and it might be, um, you know, WSO1 or whatever. How do you do that so that it then heads off to your affiliate link? I'm, I'm just, is that like a redirect on the URL once you create a page? Is that? No, what I do is I have a, a plugin uh, called Ninja Affiliate Links. Right. And, and I can create affiliate links and then I can pick my own shortened URL. And whenever it goes there, it takes them, it does the redirect for me. Right, right. Well, I have to get that. Is is that is that for free by any chance? <laughs> no, 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 that's a paid one. There's there's other ones out there. I think Pretty Permalinks or, or there's um, Go Links and there's a few others that do it, I think. Yeah. So just look up affiliate redirects in WordPress plugins and you'll you'll find one that does it. That one's a pretty good one because it, it tracks clicks and stuff so I can see uh, which which of my so like for some of the WSO backstage stuff you know I can see that you know I've had 175 clicks on the link and I've sold eight copies so I can work out my conversion rates and then work out the EPC based on you know how many clicks I'm getting so I I can work out my own metrics right from that. now you raise um a, 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 an interesting I'd love to talk to you briefly about WSO Backstage. Now, you said you only started this a few months ago. Is that right? Yeah. And you've had a bit of success with it. So do you want to talk about – are you are you willing to be transparent about how that's gone with your podcasting? And you, re- I'm looking at specifically return on investment, mm. ROI, and I'm also interested yeah. in how you know your target – what analytic tools are you using for that? It's a big question. Sorry, but <laughs> that's, the, that's what I'm really interested to talk about today. Sure. So the ROI on something like that is really – about your investment so you can take the ro part and put that aside for a second is what are you investing um if you're somebody who has to go out and get a professional designer uh, and then hire somebody to install the stuff for you and then go out you know if you need all that work your cost and barrier to entry is quite high yeah so ignore entry cost but more so like just ongoing well, ongoing is, you know, really just time. It's interviewing yeah. people and the time it takes to do the edits in the show. And we have a process now for that. So we've put our screen flow templates together and stuff. So uh, it's, you know, it doesn't take too long to edit the MP3s and get those out the door. Uh, and the blog posts are, you know, 10 or 20 minutes. And then, uh, you know, to get transcriptions and things done costs a little bit of money. But if you go on Odesk or Elance, you can get a trans a, a really good transcriptionist for like five bucks an hour. So oh, that's good. So it's not it's not too bad. I know about that? Yeah. So I have a really good lady from South Africa who does ours, and I think she charges a little bit more. I think it's sort of like eight dollars an hour, but you can get you can get ones that are if you're willing to then re-listen and re-edit those 
you can get them pretty cheap. And then the other one is, it generally is a rule. It takes somewhere about 20 minutes. Uh, you get 20 minutes of audio transcribed in an hour. It's 15, 20 minutes of audio transcribed per hour is about the normal normal rate. So on an hour-long podcast, you're probably looking at 20 bucks for the transcript. But the long-term value of that is... I mean, that's great because that's not my figures. I Look, Casting Words, for instance, which is the my my bar, if you want to call that, yeah. was a, a dollar a minute. So that's yeah. $60 an hour. No, 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 no. no. I, I, yeah, that's, that's what crazy. I've been paying. Well, that's where, that's where you know. Um, that's where I'm going wrong. <laughs> yeah, learning how to, it's true. In, in, if you're an online marketer, learning how to outsource is an, is an extraordinary thing. It's it's. I thought I was outsourcing to Casting Words. Well, well, I didn't actually use them. I used someone else who was really awesome, by the way. But mm. it was around $60 per no, no, we pay about twenty, and then we have, uh, we we probably have about ten or ten or fifteen minutes of editing to do of our own at the end, so we get it back. And because occasionally, you know, the person will highlight words they didn't understand or whatever, and and we'll just go through it and give it a quick read and clean it up. Mm-hmm. But look, it's it's not a a huge. And the other thing is, it's it's leverage, right? So yeah, that goes up into a Dropbox, and then I don't see it till it's done. So I'm not doing it. So there's something that means that's time I can do something else in. So, but but you have to do the editing afterwards, didn't you? Say? We have we have somebody who does that. Yeah. Okay, so you don't personally no. do it. Okay. I'll that's I'll awesome. look at it before I put it up online. To, um, but generally speaking, I, so I don't get involved in the transcripts. I do the interviews and you know make sure things get uh, the blog posts and that get done. I'll look at the press releases um, and make sure those you know are are accurate and reflective it's not a terribly expensive thing i think people um i think it's you have to figure out what your audience is and what your monetization strategy for the podcast is so strategy yeah i think part of the problem is that if your target audience isn't one who will buy the products and services that you offer if there's no relationship there then it's a difficult thing to to spend money on because there's no return whereas you know we've got wso backstage which is really targeted at people who are buying internet marketing products and we can in the middle of that show if we chose to advertise our seo business advertise our content business and now we have related products and services that those people might want irrespective of whether or not they buy the affiliate product anyway Otherwise, we can even sell those spots. So we've already had people approach us for WSO Backstage about sponsoring the episodes. So, you know, this this podcast is brought to you by whatever. Um, So we've already had people approach us about that. Then there's the site itself. We can do advertising on the site if we really wanted to. Um, Banner ads of upcoming products. A lot of these products are open forever. They're on sale forever. So by creating the the content and the backlinks and everything else, those things might be able to sell six months from now. 